So today we're going to be talking about complex matrices, what they can do, how they're represented and what is a real world application. So without further ado, let's get started. Before moving on to complex matrices, let's first take a look at how real matrices work. So for a 2 by 2 matrix A, B, C and D, we can think of it as a linear transformation. This linear transformation is of three types. It can be rotational, it can be shearing and it can be just expanding. Now we can easily say that any general matrix A, B, C and D can be represented by the product of these three basic matrices. Now that our animations are done, let's look at some complex numbers. The unit complex number is iota and it has a special property that when it is squared it gives minus 1. And a general complex point is written in the form of a plus bi, where a is the real part and b is the imaginary part. This point does not live in the Cartesian plane, but instead it lives in the complex plane. A noteworthy point that arises is when multiplying two complex numbers or points with each other, it is equivalent to multiplying their magnitudes and adding their angles. So, if we multiply a complex number by i, it makes the point rotate by 90 degrees anti-clockwise. So i is equivalent to the rotation matrix 0, 1, minus 1 and 0. Now looking back at the complex form a plus b i, we can write 1 as an identity matrix and i as the previous matrix. Now if we simplify that, we get a b minus b a. And this precisely is the representation of a complex point. Our result that we got from the rotation and scaling matrix can also be verified by its polar representation of a complex number, which is e to the i times theta and all multiplied by r, where theta is the angle from the x-axis and r is the magnitude. It also follows that the conjugate of our number, which is equal to a minus bi, is equal to the transpose of the matrix representation or simply just negating the exponential. The polar representation tells us that we take a point P which is at a distance R from the origin on the x-axis and then we rotate it by an angle theta. R times e to the power i theta can also be expanded using Euler's identity to get R cos theta plus R i sin theta. So I think that's enough of an introduction for complex numbers and we won't be going too much details. So now let's talk about complex matrices. A complex matrix of size 2 by 2 has complex entries say alpha, beta, gamma and delta where all of these are complex numbers. Now such a matrix can also be represented by only the real values or by using the matrix representation of each complex numbers embedded into their spot. So, our matrix A will now become this, where alpha is equal to A plus Bi, beta is equal to C plus Di and so on. This representation changes the space from like complex squared to real 4. And this would require 4 dimensions to fully visualize, it's really hard. Another representation which will more in line with complex numbers is by separating out the real part and its imaginary part and then putting it back together as a complex number. So we get two separate matrices A, C, E, G and B, D, F, H where the first one represents the real part and the second one represents the imaginary part. This tells us that the complex matrix is a sum of two separate transformations, one in the purely real space and one in the purely imaginary space. This is in fact consistent with that the complex point need a real plane, a 2D plane to describe it so if complex 1 requires r square then complex square would require r4 which is what we saw before when we represented as a real matrix where each of the complex points were matrices as well you know let's go back to that and take the 4 by 4 matrix representation and let's transpose it well and now we convert it back we break it into separate chunks and then we convert it back into a complex matrix here we see that the it becomes alpha conjugate, gamma conjugate, beta conjugate and delta conjugate which somewhat resembles the original matrix but it's with a twist. It is transposed 
and it is conjugated as well. This special conjugation is called the conjugate transpose of A and is equivalent to the transpose of the real matrix associated with it. That's a fun fact. In the previous two simplifications of a complex matrix, we missed out one crucial detail, intuition. Now, with this visualization technique, it should hopefully be even clearer how matrices work their magic by visualizing how it affects entire complex vectors and their plane. So let's start with how the visualization is going to occur and how we can make sense of it. And then we'll look at what the visualization actually tells us and we see some few animations. Let's start. Now let's take the first component of V dash. We get alpha small x plus delta y. We know that alpha and delta are complex numbers. Hence, as said before, they act as rotation and scaling matrices. So our complex point small x and y are each rotated and scaled separately and then added. An addition of two vectors is equivalent to the translation of one vector with respect to another. So a vector plus b vector is equal to a vector being translated by b or b vector being translated by a. Hence, we can say that the rotated vector small x is translated with respect to another rotated vector. So let's replace small x with a capital X, which is the previously mentioned region of space where small x lives. Now our component becomes alpha times the plane of x plus delta times the vector y. Now from this we see that the plane slash domain of small x is rotated and scaled and then is translated by each and every complex point in the domain of the rotated y. And similarly, beta times small x plus delta times y becomes beta times the domain of x plus delta times small y. And it's the same thing. Let's again look at the animation of this. All these methods now allow us to appreciate complex matrices as a linear transformation in the complex squared space. Now let's look at some specific types of complex matrices and understand where they are used. Let's start by some specially cool matrices called the poly spin matrices and they are exactly used for what they sound like for spinning and rotation. Is that in 2D? Nope, it's in three dimensions. But it's just two by two matrix, how? Well, let's find out. It turns out that the poly spin matrices sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z represent the 3D space. But in a complex space, these matrices are actually defined from the relation sigma x squared is equal to sigma y squared, which is equal to sigma z squared, which is equal to the identity of 1. Another property that which define them are sigma x times sigma y is equal to i times sigma z, and sigma y times sigma z is equal to i times sigma x, and again sigma z times sigma x is equal to i times sigma y. Now, Let's represent a 3D vector in the form of poly matrices like we did before with the normal basis vectors. So like before we take the linear combination. The vector m is equal to a times sigma x plus b times sigma y plus c times sigma z. Where sigma y, sigma z, sigma x represent the basis for the 3D space. And a, B, C are the components of the 3D vector. Now we get M is equal to the matrix C, A plus B, I, A minus B, I and minus C. Now we have a way to represent a 3D vector as a 2D complex matrix. Again, taking the compact form, M can be written as a dot product between the vector A, B, C and the vector containing the poly matrices sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. And we can write this vector as just sigma. So m is equal to v dot sigma. v is our 3D vector and m is its representation in the traceless Hermitian matrix form. A traceless Hermitian matrix is just a special name given to the matrix which 
has the diagonal components are real and the traceless means that the diagonal component sum is equal to zero. Okay, now that we have described how we can represent a vector as a complex matrix, let's talk about planes. We'll be first talking about the normal xy plane. Well, it consists of one part x-axis, one part y-axis and zero part z-axis. Or, talking in terms of planes, it has one part the xy plane, zero part yz plane and zero part zx plane. So any general plane again can be written as a linear combination of these three planes. So AXY plus BYZ and CZX. Visually it will look like three planes and we scale them by different amounts. And the resulting plane is equivalent to taking the normal vector and adding them and then taking the plane for that resulting normal vector. Visually it will look like this. We are representing the normal vector as n x y and y z and z x. So for a general plane described in its normal vector form, we can say that it's a linear combination again of a times n x y plus b times n y z plus c times n z x. This is just more fancy notation. Also, this equation tells us how much you want to scale in each of the x, y and z directions. Since the normal for the x, y plane is z axis, y, z plane is x axis and the z, x plane is y axis, we can simplify further in terms of the poly matrices. So we describe a plane P of n is equal to a z hat plus b times x hat plus c times y hat. And then after some rearrangement, we replace the x, y and z hat with the poly matrices. Here the, the pn is the resulting plane normal vector and it represents again as a 2 by 2 traceless Hermitian matrix. Looking back, we can also see that the fact that x, y is i times z in the poly matrices and then we can describe the entire plane and not just the plane normal as a times the linear combination. So, after computing, we get the plane is equal to i times the plane normal, where p is the plane and pn is the plane normal. The i is there to tell us that the plane is the plane vector but rotated by 90 degrees. This is consistent with the fact that planes are orthogonal to their normal vectors. Wait, if we take the pn, it's a traceless Hermitian matrix. If we multiply it by i, we get this which turns out to be the general skew Hermitian traceless matrix. A skew Hermitian traceless matrix is like the Hermitian matrix, but it's multiplied by i, and it has a special property that when we take the conjugate transpose, it's actually equal to negative of itself. Hence, a new intuition can be formed that a Hermitian matrix may represent a vector, and we use a skew Hermitian matrix to represent a plane. It might feel like this is some random way to represent vectors and planes, but this form is actually used quite a bit in quantum mechanics and sometimes in computer science as well. Let's see an application for rotation. Let's assume we want to rotate a vector v123 by first 90 degrees and then by 180 degrees along the z-axis. First, we convert the vector v into a Hermitian matrix and we get this. And our axis of rotation is the z-axis, or in its vector representation, 0, 0, 1. Representing it as a vector, now as a Hermitian matrix, we get n hat. But we want the plane of that, so we get i times n hat will be the plane. As we saw in complex numbers, r times e to the power i theta rotates a point or a vector by theta, but hidden in that exponent, there is actually a 1 by 1 complex matrix. So it becomes r times e to the i theta times h. And since in the 2D case, the only plane is x, y where we can rotate, so the 1 by 1 Hermitian matrix would just be 1, making no difference. The Hermitian matrix would only be 1 because if we take a look at the poly matrix representing the z-axis where the rotation occurs and we take a 1 by 1 component, we get 1. But here in the 3D case, it's not a 1 by 1 matrix, but a 2 by 2 matrix. 
And since we don't want any scaling, we put r is equal to 1. So now our new rotation is defined by e to the power i theta times h. So let's do some math with it. Let's equate it to r. And then if we simplify using Euler's identity, we get r is equal to cos theta times i plus a skew Hermitian matrix times sine of theta. Sadly, we can describe a rotation this simply because doing v times r is not commutative as v and r are both matrices. So to avoid this problem, we just redefine it. Let's redefine it in terms of half angles. So we rotate it by half and then half again. So this time we define r as e to the minus i theta by 2 times h. Again, simplifying, we get r is equal to cos theta by 2 into i minus skew Hermitian matrix times sine of theta by 2. And obviously r inverse would just be the same but with a plus sign. Now we just sandwich our matrix version of our original vector that we want to rotate between r and r inverse. So we get v dash is equal to r v r inverse. And v dash is going to be another matrix. But we can convert it back by comparing with the general form to get back the vector. This gives us a nice way to represent 3D rotation without gimbal lock or using Euler angles. Isn't that just amazing? Let's look at some examples and actually see if it works or not.